Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to the first Jury Talk of the Year. Um, today we'd like to welcome Max Jansen, who is a PhD researcher here at Cardiff. Um, Max did his undergraduate in Amsterdam at Free University, and he'll be telling us about some of his PhD research today. So when you're ready, Max, if you want to take it away. Thank you very much. Um, so my talk is titled, It Came From The Abyss, Studying the Formation of Our Oceans in an Unlikely Place. And the abyss evokes some um, sense of mystery, doesn't it? And it's quite apt uh, because the oceans are actually quite unknown to us still. There's a lot of things we don't know about them. And for instance, we know a lot more about the surface of the moon than at the bottom of our sea, of our own ocean basins. Um, and that's actually quite cool for two reasons. Um, firstly, it is the, can be the topic of a lot of cool science fiction films. And secondly, there's a lot of uh, scientific discoveries waiting to be to, to still be happening. Um, and for instance, only a couple of weeks ago, you may have seen on the news that a new dive um, off the coast of Scotland went 2,000 meters deep. And so that's a place where there's no light and they found a new species of uh, coral that lives there. So literally every time we have a new investigation into the oceans, we, uh, we find something new about that. And that's the same for the geology of the ocean basins. We're still learning a lot about it. And actually it was not even that long ago when people thought that the ocean basins were permanent features. So if you think about how old the history of the earth is, the earth is four and a half billion years old. Um, if the oceans have been there since the beginning of time, basically, that means that sediments from the continents have been eroding through geological time and been deposited regularly on the ocean basins. And that's illustrated in this chart on the left here from the late 19th century. Uh, where you can see all the periods of Earth's history basically accumulating in a thin sediment layer at the bottom of the sea. But even as recent as the 1960s, you would see books that were published that say could, there could be an uninterrupted series of sediments that as old as the ocean itself. So today we have a little bit different idea of the our oceans. At the top you can see what we thought in the 1960s and then in the bottom we have a new emerging model of plate tectonics that we use to explain the world today. Now in this model the oceans are not permanent but they're actually um, uh, part of the plate tectonic model and in that model we have the surface of the earth is divided up into tectonic plates which can move horizontally and the continents in this model are the more permanent features that kind of drift on top of a, a a mobile ductile mantle layer um, and the oceans they move about as well and they collide and whenever oceans and continents collide because the oceans are thinner and a bit more dense um, they subduct and they get returned into the earth's mantle and in other places where the plates the oceanic plates are moving apart um, what you get there is it's not a gap that you suddenly have no uh, no crust there but con continuously new material is being brought up to fill that gap and as that material rises, the mantle material, it decompresses. And because of this decompression, um, parts of it melts. And these melts ascend to the surface and they form new crust. So this is a process that happens at um, mid-ocean ridges, the, at the centers of the ocean. And it's continually happening. So as we speak, um, the plates are moving slowly apart and new magma is being accumulated at the plate boundaries to create new crust. And we study the crust um, using a variety of technique. Um, one of them is uh, using seismic waves to determine what kind of rock types are down there. And early seismic studies, they determined that you have uh, a layered structure to the oceanic crust that are made of different rock types. And from this model, we derived what we call a Penrose crust. So you can see that we have a mantle layer, uh, which is followed by a, a gabbroic layer, and then we have basalts at the very top. And uh, to find out if this is true, um, we can go out into sea and we can drill into the rock to see if we find these layers as the deeper we go. Now we've been drilling since the 60s and exploring the oceans um, in this new plate tectonic model for about um, 60, 70 years now. Um, and this is a, a map of the ocean. As you can see, the uh, youngest oceanic crust is near the plate boundaries, the spreading ridges. And the further away you get, the older the crust becomes. And the more we've been exploring our oceans, the more we actually find out that the picture is a lot more complicated than, uh, than that simple model. 
So for instance, um, not every plates boundary, not every mid-ocean ridge has the same rate of spreading. You have uh, portions of the earth, such as the Pacific Ocean, where the plates are moving apart rather fast and other parts where they're moving apart rather slowly. And this matters because the faster the, the plates move apart, the more melting occurs and the more magma you have and therefore the hotter your system is. So if we look at the East Pacific rise in the Pacific uh, Ocean, we see that because of this melt rich, magma rich environment, which is hot, in the seismics, you see a, th a, a reflector, which represents a thin magma chamber or a melt lens where melts accumulates and crystallize to form the crust. And this type of crust um, looks very similar to the Penrose model. So you have this layer, uh, layered structure. However, when you go to the slower portions of the oceans, um, things get a bit more complicated. So here we see a map of the part of the North Atlantic Ocean at the mid-ocean ridge. And this is a gravity anomaly map. So what you do is you look for very small variations in the gravitational field of the Earth. And they can tell you something about the density of the rock that's, uh, that the Earth is made up of on that part. So on this map, you see kind of like a bullseye pattern. And these, the center of these bullseyes are areas where the crust is thought to be thicker. Um, and in between the bullseyes, it's thought to have thinner crusts. And if you move closer to um, parts where there's uh, where the crust is thinner, you can uh, sometimes you, the crust is exposed along large transform boundaries, such as here, a bit further south. Um, and you can measure, you can take a submersible and dive, and you can measure the thickness of the units. And you see that the crust is actually thinner than the original Penrose model suggests. And this led to new models, such as this one, where you have a laterally variable crust structure. So you have thick crust in the centers, and then you have rich discontinuities, circled, where the crust is thinner. Um, and sometimes at these rich discontinuities, you even find large dome-shaped mountains on the seafloor. These are kilometers high. Um, and the way these form is that the spreading there is um, slow enough that there's not a lot of melt present because there's not a lot of melt. There's, it's a quite a cold system. And when the rocks get cooler, they start to deform brittly. So that's what you see in this diagram. You see a kilometer sized fault that reaches all the way down into the mantle and that is exhuming the deeper parts of the crust. And there's hardly any melts being added to it from the crust. And still other places where the crust is spreading or the plates are spreading even slower, you find um, portions, if you look at the gravity anomaly map here again, where there's hardly, for hundreds of kilometers, there's hardly any crust at all. Um, and if you dive down there, you find that you don't find um, basaltic or uh, mag magmatic rocks, but you find mantle rocks themselves exposed at the seafloor. So this gave rise to quite recent concept of amagmatic spreading. So this is spreading that is so slow that there's no melts being formed and you get large stretches of the ocean which have no uh, basaltic crust, but just uh, mantle peridotites exposed at the seafloor. So this exploring of the ocean um, is done with these huge ships um, that can they have a big drill tower on top of them and they can drill all the way down into the deep crust. Um, but as you can probably imagine, these ships are very expensive and um, a lot of money is needed to, to fund research like this. So in the 50, 60 years that we've been doing this research, we've not have that, we don't have that many deep um, holes of the ocean and only four of them are deeper than one kilometer which if you remember the original diagram, the crust is thought to be six to seven kilometers deep. So we're basically only scratching at the surface. So what do we do to, if we wanna find out more about the ocean? Well, for my research, I went to Masira Island, which is a desert. And you might ask yourself, why would you go there? Um, so I'm gonna to try to explain my PhD projects using the, the five Ws, who, what, when, where, why, how, um, to give you a better idea of what I'm trying to find out. And we'll start with the why. Why did I go to Masira? So Masira Island is an ophiolite. And an ophiolite is a fragment of oceanic crust that's preserved on land. So if you remember, most of the oceanic crust usually subducts and goes back into the Earth's mantle. But some places on Earth uh, preserve oceanic crust. And you can see that on this map. You can see there's actually quite a lot of ophiolites around. And they are useful because rather than looking at a drill core, you can actually look at the outcrops. You can walk around, you can park your car, you can walk around these massive uh, piles of lava basalts, or you can go deeper into the crust and find out um, what, what the deeper crust looks like. 
And you can use these observations to th synthesize a model and to look at the relations of these units to come up with an idea of what the, what the crust looks like and how it was formed. Um, and just to illustrate that, when you're looking at a drill core, as you do with a, an ocean drilling ship, um, you're bringing out a piece of rock that is basically one dimensional. You're only looking in the downward direction. Um, and you might recover something that looks like this. And then when you're describing it, you see like, oh yeah, okay, this is kind of a layered, a rhythmically layered rock where you have lighter rock and darker rock. Um, and that will inform your model. But the benefit of having an outcrop is that you can walk around it in 3D. You can actually see a lot of structures that you would miss if you were to just look in one dimension. So here you can see that this, this darker body of rock on the left side of the screen actually cross cuts the original rock. And you would completely have missed that um, if you, uh, if you were just drilling. However, there is a problem with ophiolites, and that is we don't really know where they come from. They're preserved, but it's always a bit of a, a guess at how they were formed or where they were formed. Um, so one thing that we have noticed is that if you look at the compositional differences, or if you look at the compositions of the lavas, ophiolites are actually a bit different than the lavas that you find in the ocean. So in the, these two plots, you don't have to know exactly what's, uh, what is on the axis here, but the point is that in red, you see the, the modern day oceans, and in blue, you have these things called back arc basins. You can see there are clear differences in their chemical compositions. And a back arc basin, just to illustrate here below, it's also a spreading center, um, where you, so you have an oceanic ridge where the plates are moving apart and you get a new crust formed, but it's quite close to a subduction zone. And because it's so close, you get interaction between the subduction zone and the, the material that's ascending here. Um, and these differences in chemistry in the lavas imply that you've had different processes that form these lavas, and different processes means that you might have different, um, different densities or different viscosities and different processes that actually form the crust. So you don't know exactly um, if you're comparing like with like. And then the second question is, why didn't the ophiolite subduct? Like most oceanic crust subducts, so clearly, if you have something that was preserved, it's unusual in some way. And that's a big question. So we're not really sure how far we can take the analogy. And that's a constant point of discussion. Now, back to Masira. Masira is, as far as we can tell, structurally and compositionally similar to the Indian Ocean. So what does that mean? Um, if we look at a seismic line um, of the continental margin of uh, the Arabian Peninsula going into the Indian Ocean, we see that Masira Island, which is exposed here at the top, um, it actually forms part of the oceanic crust which extends into the Indian Ocean Basin. So that's a good sign that uh, Masira um, is actually part of the Indian Ocean crust, and that when we're studying Masira, we can say something about the Indian Ocean crust. Uh, secondly, if we look at the chemistry of the lavas at Masira, you see that they are all more similar to the red to the red compositions, which are the modern ocean uh, lavas, than they are to the blue ones. So Masira is quite unique, and it gives us an opportunity to study real oceanic lithosphere. Now, moving on to where, as I've already said, Masira is in the Middle East. It's part of Oman, and it's an island off the coast here. Um, and this is the first geological map of the area, which was made in the 20s. Um, and already then, um, you, could, uh, you can see that the igneous rocks on Masira were uh, noted as being special and uh, irregular. But actually, for thousands of years, uh, people have known that Masira is quite significant, geologically speaking. So if you go to Masira, you find these, uh, these structures, which are estimated to be two to 3,000 years old. And around these structures, you find um, outcrops, which have these very turquoise, bright blue uh, veins. And these are copper-bearing minerals of malachite and chrysocolla. Um, and you find these bits of copper slag around as well. So what happened here was that people were uh, mining certain rock types in the Sira to get to the copper oil and uh, pur purifying it as well. Also, you find uh, scattered shell beds with holes in them um, that are very regularly uh, organized. So this is a sign of what these early miners were eating, and most of their food came from the sea. Now, as, as uh, still today, a lot of the, the foods uh, from the people of Masira comes from the sea. It's a very rich fishing grounds, 
um, and it's modernized quite a lot recently. But in the old days, you can imagine that life must have been quite tough. So here you see some older photos of the, of the people living there. And um, yeah, most of the food came from the sea. Um, there's not much, it's because it's a desert, you cannot grow there much. And uh, also the water there was brackish at best. So the only drinking water was quite salty, um, which must have been quite rough. Now Masira also rose to a more international prominence in the from the 30s onwards, when the British Royal Air Force um, started a base, uh, created, founded a base there, um, as you can see on these photos. And they used it as a staging grounds during the Second World War, and it played quite a significant role in that. Here you see the, the Shaikh at the time, and the original agreements that was hand signed by the uh, the British commanders and the Shaikh. And originally they made a deal that the the Royal Air Force could store, store some oil drums on the islands and use it as a refueling station. And gradually it grew out to a, a larger air base. And you can still find um, signs of that. As you can see here, this structure was built using mostly oil barrels because it's a good building material in a, in an, on an island where there's not much else around to build out of. And actually this was also geologically speaking relevant because one of the people that was um, a pilot during the Second World War got curious in these, these black unusual mountains that were behind the airfield base. And he was looking close at them. And when he came back after the war, he studied geology and became a professor. And in the seventies, he, he came back with one of his students and created the first detailed geological map of Mesilla. Um, and later on uh, another team uh, from the Swiss University of Bern, led by Chuck Peters, uh, created a more, an even more detailed map of the area. So if you go to Mesilla today, um, it's still quite remote. You can take an airplane to Muscat, uh, the capital of Oman, which is here in the north, and then you have to drive for five to six hours through the deserts, and you see very little. And then you have to, once you get to the shoreline, you have to take a ferry across to the island, and this is not your typical Dover Calais ferry where you make a booking and you have a spot on the boat. This is basically if the boat is full, then the boat leaves and then you have to wait for the next one. And as you can see, they make they do a lot of effort to get the boat as full as possible. There's lorries and everything. And then after this, you uh, you unload from the boat and then you can go into the fields and study these rocks. Um, and you can, and there's a town on the north of the islands where you can get your um, basic necessities and enjoy the bustling nightlife. So then we move on to when. When did Masira form? These earlier geologists that I spoke of previously, um, they looked at uh, microfossils because microfossils are very useful of um, because they ev evolve so rapidly and they change very slightly. Um, they're very useful for dating rocks. So, and, and a few of them were actually first described on Masira, and they're named after the island of Masira in their species name, which is quite cool. Um, so if you look at uh, the bottom here, we have a cross section of the islands. Um, and if you look at samples from the sediments which directly overlie the oceanic crust and which were deformed with the oceanic crust, um, the oldest of these, these are radiolaria species, the oldest of these are about 150 million years old. So we're looking at quite a long time ago. Um, then also you can look at the latest sediments. So the sediments at the top here, which overlie all other rocks, and therefore they must be younger than all the other rocks. And the fossils from these rocks are 66 million years old. So now immediately we have two ages um, that are noteworthy. So we have the formation age, which is uh, constrained by these uh, by these radiolaria, which is 150 million years old. And then we have the abduction or the emplacement age uh, of Masira, which is when Masira was in the position it is in today. And that is 66 million years old. Um, now these are um, not, um, not necessarily the most accurate dating methods. So what I did is I took some rocks uh, to confirm these uh, ages. And I took them directly from the oceanic crust and I put them in this machine which saps it with 180,000 volts. And then doing that, the rock breaks apart. And you can collect individual crystals. And these arrows are pointing towards zirconium crystals. And these zirconium crystals are special because they contain uranium. And uranium, as you know, is radioactive and it decays to lead. And if you measure the 
the concentration of uranium and lead very carefully and you work out the ratio, you can work out how old the rock was um, when it formed or how long ago it formed. Um, and it's not necessarily that these techniques um, are new, this, this has been done since the 50s, but specifically oceanic rocks are, have very little zirconium in them. So um, it makes it very difficult to date oceanic rocks. And now that machines have become more and more precise, we're able to do this more and more precise. And this work roughly confirmed the, the earlier work. It's uh, the new age I proposed for Ms. Harris, slightly younger, but still quite a long time ago. So we're looking at 135 million years old. Now, that's a long time ago. Uh, what did the world look like back then? Well, first of all, there were a lot of very different animals um, and plants um, in the oceans and on land. But also the, the world looked very different then. As you can see here, the continents were in very different places than we might know today. And this was actually just after the breakup of the supercontinent Pangaea. And there was still quite a large landmass called Gondwana um, in the south of the globe. Um, and that was also breaking apart. And Masira was actually at that time in where this yellow, um, yellow circle was. And as Africa was rifting from India, a new ocean formed, a thin young ocean, slightly comparable to what you might uh, see in the Red Sea today, where Arabia is separating from Africa. So you've got this narrow ocean where the plates are starting to move apart and you start forming oceanic crust. And that's where we think Masira uh, originates from. Okay, now we move on to what. And if we go to Masira, what do we actually see there? So as I already said, it's the benefit of, um, um, of ophiolites is that you can walk around and study the, the rock units in three dimensions. So over here, we do just that. And we see that we have the mantle rock. So the, the deepest part of the, um, of the lithosphere um, is um, overlain by layered gabbros. And then we go to upper gabbros. And this thickness is uh, quite important because it's quite thin for what we expect for oceanic crust. So this mountain is 200 meters and we see three different units in it, um, meaning that these units are quite thin. And then we can go um, do this for other parts of the crust as well, and then we can make this reconstruction. And we see that the entire crust is actually quite thin from what we're used to. So two kilometers at best compared to the, uh, the six to seven kilometers that we know from the, uh, the Penrose model. And other parts of the islands, we have the mantle rocks again, but here we don't see any gabbros at all. We see instead that we have uh, dolerite dikes, uh, which are directly intruding the mantle. And a little bit further on, we see in this hillside, we see the same. We see mantle rocks and then we see dolerite dikes again. But here they're directly overlain by Cretaceous sediments. And if you look a bit closer here, you see that very nicely. You see a dike, which is directly overlain by a carbonate platform here. Now, this is important because sediment, for sediments to accumulate here, it must mean that this must have been at the sea floor. So we have mantle rocks and uh, dikes at the sea floor uh, directly. So all of this tells us that the oceanic crust on Masera is thinner than we would normally expect. Um, so we have these two, uh, these two reconstructions where we have a thin crust or a crust where uh, a portion of the lithosphere where the crust might even be missing. Um, don't necessarily know how, how they're connected laterally. Um, and if we compare that to the original models that I showed you in the beginning, we see that um, it's very different from what we would expect. So um, I showed you that we thought we had um, in the ocean, we had thick um, normal layered crust and um, dismembered um, crust at rich uh, discontinuities with the large detachment faults. But in Masira, we don't see either of those things. We see a full succession of crust, but it's a lot thinner. And then we also have dikes uh, intruding the mantle directly. So we can call this a Masira type lithosphere or Penrose on a diet. Now, another thing we see at Masira, if we go back to this mountain and we look specifically at the mantle rocks. Now, if you remember the mantle is the material that is ascending when the plates are moving apart. And as it ascends, it's melting and that those melts go on to form the crust. Now we can look at the chemistry of those mantle rocks. Um, and again, the, the exact chemical values are not that important here. What is important here is that we're comparing Masira, which is at the top, um, to all the other crusts, oceanic crusts that we know of. And we can see that um, Masira is quite far on the spectrum of melting. So Masira has, the mantle of Masira has melted a lot compared to other oceanic, um, oceanic uh, locations. 
And this is um, contrary to what we would expect based on what I just told you previously, because I said that the, the actual crust atmosphere is thinner than we expect. So we would expect to be having less melting, but instead we have more. So this is our second observation. The mantle is more refractory than expected based on the observed crustal thickness. And then the third um, has to do with uh, cross-cutting relationships. And to explain that, I will give you a brief example. Um, geologists can tell a story based on cross-cutting relationships. And here we see an example um, of a street in Cardiff. And as an ordinary member of the public, you might be quite confused what is Cardiff Council trying to tell you here. But as a geologist, this tells actually a very interesting story because from this picture, I can deduct that at first we had a road, number one. Um, later, some people dug a trench there and then covered up with asphalt, number two. And lastly, somebody implanted or installed a street light there that they, um, that they powered with the cables that run through this trench. So we can, instead of just looking at uh, things, the spatial relationships, we can get a temporal relationship and we can work out what happens first and what happens later. So if we go back to this outcrop here, um, we can uh, do that for this as well. Uh, what we see here is we see several dikes cross-cutting Gabro. So based on the same cross-cutting relationships as before, we can say we first had a Gabro that was formed, then later that was formed by this first dike, and then, uh, or cross-cut by this first dike, and then after that, it was cross-cut by the second dike. Now we can also take samples from these dikes, and we can measure the composition of those. And we can actually see that um, although all the rocks on Masira are oceanic, um, and they um, are similar to oceanic, modern oceanic rocks, the younger rocks generally are um, fall on one end of the spectrum, and the older rocks, or and the, um, so the, the rocks that formed first, sorry, fall, fall on one side of the spectrum, and then the rocks that fall were formed later, they fall on a different end of the spectrum. So we have a temporal evolution in the composition of the magmas. They get more enriched and more alkaline, as we call it. So then we move on to the final question, how did Masila form? And in this part, we have to explain our observations. So we have seen a thin igneous crust, we have a refractory mantle, and we have magma compositions which change with time, they get more enriched. And also, ideally, we would like to know why it wasn't subducted like all other oceanic crust. So to start with the first two points, um, to, to get a thin crust, we must have less melt, but we know that the melt, the, the mantle beneath Masira was melted uh, extensively compared to other oceanic uh, locations. Um, so to explain this, um, we must evoke, we must imagine a different type of mantle, um, a mantle which was maybe less uh, fusible, so it had less had ability to melt because melt had been previously extracted from it. Um, and we can understand this by imagining that the world is very old and that plate tectonics has been going on for a long time. So the, the mantle has been recycled many times before, and every time it uh, ascends again in a new cycle, it melts a little bit. And after this has happened many times, um, you, you, uh, the, the mantle becomes less and less able to melt. So the mantle beneath Masira must have been a, a mantle which was already melted quite a lot and could not have been melted more. So then we move on to our uh, magma compositions. And um, we, we go back to what the Earth looked like 130 million years ago when Masira was formed. And this was actually an important moment in the world's history because at this point, the plates changed direction. So where first India was um, rifting from Africa, suddenly India started moving northwards. And what happens then is that the, the plate boundaries, they suddenly get new motion um, along them. And instead of a rifting motion, you get a strike slip motion. And if you zoom in on what this happened, uh, what is happening here, because the original rifting was oblique and you get this very jagged tectonic plate boundary. Um, if you zoom in when that changes to strike slip motion, you get areas where the plates are being pulled, pulled apart locally and that can induce new melting. And you get places where the, the plates are being pushed together and you can induce thrusting where the one plate is moving over, to, over the top of the other. Um, science 
that this happens are still present in uh, off the coast of Africa today. So these are seismic profiles again, where in the top one, you can see that uh, later volcanism has cross-cut the crust and there's like um, fossil volcanic edifices visible. And in the bottom cross section, you can see places where the crust have actually um, moved together and overthrust each other. So um, this, this change of motion caused in Masira to, uh, to, to have new melts formed, which because it's a slightly different process has different compositions, the amount of melting was less, making the melts more enriched and more alkaline. And these formed these later cross-cutting dikes. And also these structures of overthrusting were formed, which uh, are quite significant. And we can actually imagine that if you have these um, these, weak, these uh, zones of weakness where previous faulting has occurred, that later on, um, when the oceanic plate of India is actually colliding with the Arabian margin, these zones of weaknesses are used to overthrust um, as planes of overthrusting. And uh, that could be one mechanism for how Masira is actually preserved on land rather than being abducted. So making use of pre-existing structures. Um, so in conclusion, Masira can help us to, um, to better understand oblique spreading ridges and also better understand off-axis volcanism. And both these features are present in the present day oceans. So quite large parts of the South, uh, Southwest Indian Ocean are currently obliquely spreading at a slow rate. And also mid-ocean ridges are quite often uh, punctuated with oceanic islands, which are not formed generally during rifting, but must have formed off-axis somehow. Now I'd like to find, end with the last question, who? And this is all the people that were part of this uh, research over the past four years. I'd like to extend my thanks for all the help they've offered and advice. So that concludes my talk. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks very much, Max. That was great. Um, if anyone has questions for Max, then please do put them into the Q&A. You can find that in the um, middle center down at the bottom of your screen. And there should be a function called Q&A where you can write your questions in there and I'll be able to read them out for Max. So please do add those there. And um, just while we're waiting for people to type, I have a general question, Max, that's okay. So mm -hmm. are there any other, is it off your lights that you've been to um, or any that you would like to go to that you haven't yet given funding? Right, yeah, good question. Um, there are many ophiolites. There's actually one in the UK. So if you don't have the money to travel that far, you can drive down to Cornwall and go to the Lizard, which is a, a small ophiolite, which is, um, yeah, it's quite small, but it's still quite nice to look at. So if you're interested in the rocks there, you can have a look. Um, myself, I'm actually quite curious. There's another ophiolite comparable to Masila, which is thought to be a uh, real oceanic crust. And that's uh, south of Australia, it's a small island in the Southern Pacific Ocean called Macquarie Islands. Um, it's really hard to get to, even further away than Masila. Um, but the rocks there would be interesting to look at as well to see how similar they are or how different they are. Great. Well, I've learned something each day because apparently I've already been to one and I didn't realize because I've definitely been down to the lizard before. Okay, just check if we had any questions in. Um, I think there's also a raise hand function if anyone would like to ask their question out loud, we can experiment with that. Okay, well, I guess that means that your talk was so clear that everyone understood everything, so <laughs> congratulations. Um, but yeah, it's getting to the time that we should wrap up today. So thank you everyone for coming along. Um, this talk and our previous geo talk should be available on YouTube if you want to watch this one back or see any of the others, I'd highly recommend that. Um, but once again, thanks very much, Max, for such a great talk. Um, and if you see in the comments, someone has no questions, but love the presentation. So that's all you need. <laughs> well done. Thanks, Max. Thank you very much. Bye.